Hello, hello. So, welcome. My name is Pam Taji. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts here at Wesleyan. I'm also the uh, co-founder and managing director of the Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance. So I just, uh, I, we've been looking forward to this day for a really long time, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major occasion. We are, um, we are founding the first ever master's program in performance curation, mm -hmm. and uh, that's as a result of the work of many of the people in this room. And um, there are many people to give a shout out today. I can't possibly name them all, but I'll just identify them in groups. First, the Center for the Arts staff and interns. Uh, the Wesleyan faculty who helped shape this program and helped uh, really uh, shepherd it uh, through the processes here so it could become a degree program. The visiting uh, curators who have kept this program vibrant and have found time in their schedules, their very busy schedules, to make this program a priority. Our alumni, we have 34 now and 17 of them are here today, yeah. so I'd like to give a special shout out to the alums. And uh, of course, our funders. Uh, the very first time that we brought Wesleyan faculty together with um, <coughs> practitioners from the field, we had a summer retreat. And the New England Foundation for the Arts, uh, the great Rebecca Blunk, uh, stepped forward and said yes, uh, that, that she would fund this initiative. So we honor her. And uh, then uh, followed uh, quickly uh, by um, our partnership with Dance Space Project and uh, a grant from the Doris Tuke Charitable Foundation to make our partnership real and to experiment with, with what that partnership could be. And uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, who made a multi-year commitment on an idea, on a, on a, 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 a moment in time where uh, they realized that this, uh, this program needed to exist and gave us a multi-year grant so we could test and refine uh, what we'll be uh, presenting today. So a special shout out to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And Susan is here. here is Susan. So um, Sam asked me to just give a brief history, so I will. Um, we had uh, Sam Miller uh, is, is the author of this idea. He brought this idea to his alma mater in 2008-2009. Uh, uh, we then met with faculty to put together a proposal that was then fleshed out in a retreat that went before the faculty and we were approved for a two-year pilot uh, of the certificate program, which is the nine-month um, nine certificate program. And then uh, this past fall, as planned, we put forward to the faculty our proposal for the master's program. And in the spring of this year, the faculty and the Board of Trustees uh, endorsed this uh, new program. So um, with that, I just want to say a few words about why Wesleyan. Why is Wesleyan the site of this program? Well, first of all, uh, the arts have always been central to the liberal arts education here at Wesleyan. Forty years ago, uh, this institution dedicated an 11 building campus to the arts, to the production, the research, and the exhibition of the arts at a time when so few liberal arts colleges had made uh, this a priority. Uh, we brought, we were one of the first institutions to bring non-Western artists to our faculty in the music department and in dance. We brought artists from Indonesia, from West Africa, and from India. We also, uh, over the past uh, 15 years, have worked to push beyond the boundaries of the buildings at the Center for the Arts and not only support the work of our faculty and students, but also seek to find new ways to integrate artists into the curricular and co-curricular life of our campus. And finally, I think it's important to note that Wesleyan University Press has a tradition of being one of the foremost publishers of dance scholarship and performance scholarships and scholarship, and there is uh, many ways, many synergies that we have and that we will have in the future with West Press. So for all of those ideas, uh, Wesleyan is a home for the Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance. Our goal is to create a cohort of academically trained performance curators who are able to historicize, contextualize, and advocate for performance in ways that curators in the visual arts have been doing for years. And in so doing, 
create more platforms, better flat platforms, sites, and communities for work to be researched, contextualized, presented, and discussed. By bringing Wesleyan faculty together with curators who are innovating and experimenting in the field, our curriculum has a built-in means of staying current and moving our field forward. The input that we hope to receive from each of you today and, then, and, and today and tomorrow is central to this effort. Your point of view is going to shape the next stage of our project's development. So to guide us and facilitate this discussion, I want to now introduce our own Sam Miller, graduate of Wesleyan University, the founder, co-founder, and uh, program director of ICPP, and also the president of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Give it up for Sam. Thank you, Pam. Um, thank you all very much for coming to this uh, day and a half. About 40 years ago, I saw a Twyla Tharp over in the theater across the way, and the rest is history. <laughs> um, the company performed Sue's Leg, named after Sue Weil at the uh, Walker Arts Center. In many ways, you could think of Sue as kind of the, the starting point for our work here today. Um, I want to thank Delmore Schwartz for the <coughs> name for the convening. Um, uh, you know, when you come up with these ideas, to, uh, to support dance and contemporary performance is based on what you hear from your friends and colleagues, from uh, the artists that you know, the artists you care about. Um, and the agenda for today and tomorrow is really about um, that kind of listening. Um, we felt like the time was right to open up what we've been doing with the 34 students and faculty, um, open it up more to the field, both through the master's program, but also through a, some kind of a publications programming, and uh, maybe convening based on, you know, this template is potentially a way to go. It's, and what we really need from you um, today and tomorrow is. Um, you know, it's not so much specific recommendations on what time to schedule the course in the morning, but more your sense of um, what the field is thinking and needs and how we can be responsive to the field. Um, you know, when we started this program five years ago, we couldn't have imagined uh, what's gone on over the last five years in terms of the intersection of performance and visual arts and media going on at universities and museums, galleries uh, throughout the country and the world. But this program feels um, you know, valid, relevant, um, and useful, and we hope to make it more so uh, through the dialogue this next day and a half. And the agenda is really, you know, packed, and it's meant to be a, a sort of a, an exchange back and forth between, um, you know, the folks that have inspired the program, and and you as, you know, co-inspirators. Um, so we'll hear from uh, Judy and Philip and Thomas, uh, with Pam moderating, um, give you a sense of the kind of core discussion around curatorial practice that informs the program, and then we'll hear from you. Um, you'll have, be able to have lunch and talk among yourselves with, a, with, a, with at least two of our key people at each table. Then we'll ask one of you from each table to be on a panel, which will give us kind of the thoughts that emerge from your lunch and discussion. And then we'll start with four tables, and then we'll hear from Christy Edmonds, who's past and current and future practice 
you know, again, are an inspiration to us all. Then we'll hear from four more of you, uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll uh, have some dinner, talk, <laughs> you'll tell us what's on your mind, and then we'll hear from Ralph Lemon in a sort of performance lecture that I think is emblematic of the work we want to support. And then Saturday morning, those of you who haven't made your thoughts known will have an opportunity to help us shape something um, that we hope will be of value to the field. Um, so I, I look forward to spending uh, this day and a half with you. Um, no, you know, uh, nobody, uh, when I was at Jacob's Pillow, I was, um, after 10 years, I was asked to go to the New England Foundation for the Arts. Um, and that re invitation really came from Rebecca Blunk, you know, in spirit and in person. And we worked together for 10 years. And within that 10 years, started the National Dance Project and did some other stuff. And I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Rebecca Blunk, who sadly passed away recently. And I'm really glad to see my friends and colleagues here from NIFA. And my willingness to keep doing this work and to be in dialogue with you is really inspired by her example. It's a privilege to be with you all today. Thank you. right are the core faculty of our curatorial practice course and um, our students learn very much by uh, hearing uh, about case studies of, of um, the work of these fine people to my right and um, it's extraordinary to me uh, the, uh, the wisdom that they have brought um, to Wesleyan to uh, our students and how they continue to um, refresh uh, the curriculum year after year, vitalized by what they're doing in their home institutions. So our, our, the, the curriculum of that course um, focuses on analyzing and critiquing these case studies uh, from the faculty members, and students learn how these practices fit into the whole global uh, scene of curating performance. And so, um, its lead faculty member is our partner, Judy Hesse Taylor from Dance Space Project. And the two core faculty members are Philip Byther, who is the director of uh, performance uh, curation at the Walker Arts Center, and Thomas Lax, who um, up until, I guess, this Thursday, <laughs> is the assistant curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, and will become the associate curator in the Department of Media and Performance Art at the Museum of Modern Art. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to start out off um, by uh, asking them to speak about what is curatorial practice and performance. We are asked that question all the time. And so um, that's the overarching question that I've asked them to answer in this first section, but from the perspective of the work that they do. So um, we're going to begin with Philip who is working at a, as a performance curator in a contemporary art center setting. I want to ask, um, Philip, what uh, has been the relationship between you and the, uh, as the performing arts curator and the visual arts curators at the Walker? If you could talk a little bit about that, what have been some of the successes and challenges of that work? And uh, what are some of the considerations that you have to take into account as you uh, work as the curator of multiple forms, multiple performance forms? So take it away, Philip. Thanks, Pam. I'm going to start also with just saying a few things about how I define curatorial practice in performance, which is an evolving field. Um, and I think, you know, growing up as a presenter where the primary responsibilities are one of connoisseurship, um, sort of selecting, scheduling, marketing events for a public and knowing one's audience, I think the things that separate um, this evolving practice are first a commitment to research and to knowledge building, understanding the lineage of an artist's work, um, the core historical context from which they come. Um, 
I probably the most important thing for me is the depth of attention and care given to an artist. Um, and that we're going to talk about, I think, a little bit later, what is artist-centered practice. Um, and, and then also a willingness to contribute to a body of scholarship nationally. That's something that I think in the museum world is, is, is a given, um, but in the presenting field is just still evolving, knowing that you can, you can serve a national field in, in through um, writing, through many other platforms. Um, personally, for me at the Walker, my favorite approach and platform are long, um, uh, extended video interviews with all of the commissioned artists and then having them available on the Walker channel online. Um, we now have 20 years and over 100 conversations with artists. Um, that serve as something of a backbone of history of where those artists were when they were making new work. Um, also serving as an empathetic intermediary between the artist, the audience, and the institution. Um, uh, really key to curating is developing and applying your own particular point of view, and uh, particularly in the framing of an artist's work for a community and for an institution. Sometimes that verges into actually participation or input on the creation of the work as well. That, of course, requires a tremendous amount of trust with the artist um, and self-confidence in one's own perspective. Um, you know, I, I find that in curating performance, what that term alludes to, really draws from the, I hope, the best uh, of the practices of curating visual art and the best practices of presenting. And from presenting, you know, many of us take, in, take it for as a given that we curate per, um, experience, that we shape time-based interface interfaces between audiences and live events um, with keeping in mind the social, architectural, and cultural spaces that we inhabit. Um, it also requires, I think, being cognizant of one's own aesthetic and cultural biases and trying to work against them and expand them and use strategies to go beyond one's own limitations. Um, also a willingness to upend and to uh, question the standard structures and frameworks that many of us have grown up in and um, are used to using. And, um, also, uh, you know, this comes from the presenting side as well, having a deep understanding of one's own community um, and communities, your current audiences and the ones you hope to reach, the issues and themes that resonate when, within one's own city or state. Um, and uh, s although it, you may choose to work against them or provoke, but you should have to have a very deep understanding of where your surrounding audiences are coming from. Finally, for me personally, um, the value I think I hold most dearly besides an artist-centric um, orientation is, is coming from a place of passion and persuasiveness. This starts with the passion, the needing to love and being really attached to the artists and the work that you want to offer, but then also being able to persuade others uh, around why that work matters. Um, I'm gonna um, jump to a couple of just examples uh, of things now going to Pam's question of how do the visual art curators and the performing art curators at the Walker work together? Because there's very different cultures that we come from. There's a lot of logistical limitations. One is timetables. Exhibitions are planned two, three, four, five years in advance. Seasons are put together a year or two in advance. Film programs are put together three months in advance. So how do you bring these energies together? We are still in, I think, a process of experimenting at the Walker. We have very strong programs in each of these different artistic disciplines. Um, but more and more, following the times we live in, we are, we are f looking for ways that we can collaborate more, we can emerge um, maintain our multidisciplinary strengths, but also really achieve some new interdisciplinary um, uh, projects and, um, and efforts. Um, so a few examples, I'm just gonna start. Um, oh, sorry, great. Um, Eko and Coma, many of you in the room know about this project. I have to, 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 to give credit to Sam Miller, whose vision was to take dance artists and create a three-year retrospective across multiple institutions, multiple cities. Our contribution to this was to bring Eko and Como in for the longest residency, I think, in our history of the program, eight weeks at the Walker um, consecutively. I wanted them to begin with showing their staged work, and we actually had them perform their latest work, which we helped co-commission Raven, for a free family audience on a Saturday to launch their residency. And then um, this is a talk they did with kids from three to like 15 who were fascinated with the work. 
Um, but then build an exhibition, an exhibition which is a living installation called Naked that we took three weeks to install and ran for four weeks at the Walker. Six hours a day, Echo and Coma performed in the gallery space. We um, built this environment in a, um, uh, as part of a central place as part of an exhibition called Event Horizons um, that was showing the full multidisciplinary spectrum of work at the Walker. Um, it was very successful. We also produced a catalog um, uh, that, um, involved, that included commissioned essays um, and a full spectrum of all the works that Ekon Koma had created, um, a description and great uh, array of photographs. Um, whoops. Sarah Mitchelson, I'm going to just um, skip because I don't really have the time, but she's an artist I just want to mention. We produced a project at the opening of the Walker 10 years ago, which, which really was before we were actively collaborating. And in some ways, it was a confrontation and a provocation about how these disciplines live together. These are just a, a few images that came from that piece, Daylight, um, from Minneapolis. And I can talk about Sarah later. But I want to lastly finish with a, um, a series of music events that we called Sound Horizons. We were facing a dilemma. Um, of how do we present truly experimental music, um, particularly um, extended technique, uh, musicians, um, uh, artists that really push the edges of sound art and music. And we decided to um, create a series in galleries of 20 minute sets repeated three times within, uh, with appropriately chosen gallery spaces um, and offer it free to audiences, really lower the bar for people so that they could access this work and that, at first, was just placing music in a gallery space um, that we thought would be intriguing and an interesting contrast or a, a sort of complementary space. Um, this is an Ernesto Neto installation drawn from the Cunningham collection that we acquired. Um, this was a Bruce Nauman video installation uh, that Nate Woolley was performing in. Um, but it led to, then, uh, our asking the sculptor installation artist Jim Hodges, who is a huge music fan, to work with us as our curator of his a series of concerts. He became very um, involved in the life of musicians and felt that there was a deep connection between mu um, music, the music artists that he suggested um, and his own work. So it started with the drummer Dave King from The Bad Plus that performed in three different parts of um, the galleries. Um, and Jim selected where he thought Dave should perform. They got together and became good friends and visited each other's studios. Uh, Kevin Beasley, sound artist, um, was the end of that series. Shelley Hirsch, a vocalist. But the, the t the, I'd say the, um, the final and most successful project was he said, I would always had hoped to work someday with Sufjan Stevens, the um, art pop composer, singer, songwriter. Um, it was really th by the fact that we had talked to Sufjan over the years and he never was interested in doing anything at the Walker. When we proposed, would you be interested in doing something with the artist Jim Hodges, he suddenly, his ears perked up and said, well, now this is kind of interesting. And he said, uh, we asked, could he come and perform? He, was, he had no interest in performing. Um, and he said, came back to us and said, what if you help me make a record? Um, and you could be a commissioner of the record. So his trio, Sisyphus, which includes uh, Serengeti from Chicago, a rapper, um, Sun Lux, the electronic music artist, and Sufjan, created a record that, uh, these are the artists, by the way, um, who, who also then got so involved, they participated in the opening day dialogue with Hodges. Um, this is the record, which has the cover art that Jim gave to them for the, for the record. Uh, and this is the, this is the dialogue. And uh, of course, by the opening night, Sufjan and, Sif and uh, Sun Lux and uh, Serengeti did agree to perform, and it was a wild, great <laughs> night. But it really, um, it, this spoke to, to my mind, being willing to change your notions of frame. We just wanted Sufjan to perform in the galleries. What it ended up being was a record that we helped make happen, but it really ended up achieving a deep relationship between the visual art of Jim Hodges and the musical art of Su Sufjan Stevens and his group Sisyphus. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Great. So Thomas, um, you come from, uh, you're the person on the panel who's coming to us from the visual arts uh, curation world. And can you talk about your experience uh, in uh, curating performance in a straight ahead museum setting? And maybe a little bit about, if you have time, the transition between your work from the Studio Museum in Harlem and what you hope to do at MoMA. Definitely. Um, thank you, Pam, and thank you, Sam, um, for inviting me to be here today and on this journey over the last couple of years together. Um, so, 
As, um, as Pam mentioned, I, I work in a museum, and so I'm gonna be kind of talking about the kind of context of, um, of that work. Um, I have to say that I'm less interested in kind of defining or dividing um, two terms that have kind of often been used, um, visual arts performance um, and you know the performing arts in terms of the relationship to the museum in particular. Um, while definitely they um, involve different relationships between curators and artists and institutions, in terms of the way that artists are interested in the space of the museum um, across a variety of performing disciplines within the those two fields and in the ways that curators have begun to make exhibitions I would argue that those distinctions are increasingly becoming irrelevant um, and I'd like to speak to how um, folks working in performance have begun to use the tools of the museum, specifically art history, the space of the gallery, and the format of the exhibition um, towards their own goals. So there have been a few strategies um, over the last 15 years, and I'll kind of run through um, three examples as kind of symptomatic of these broad stroke changes that have happened um, as a way to think through why the exhibition is of interest to artists um, working in performance across multiple disciplines. So the first exhibition that you guys see here is the exhibition Out of Actions, or images from the exhibition Out of Actions, between performance and the object, 1949 to 1979, which was organized by Paul Schimmel at the um, at LA MOCA, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art. And um, as you can see here from the images, you know, of Eve Klein on the left and on the right, Carolee Schneemann, um, the exhibition tried to posit a way of thinking about artists coming out of the history of painting into making work um, in real time and space. And so um, that was, I would argue, a kind of early moment, 15 years ago approximately, of thinking about what the exhibition could do in relationship to performance. And so in the intervening years, um, moving from an interest in how performance relates to the history of painting and sculpture, I think exhibitions have increasingly focused on how uh, theatricality and theater and choreography um, and dance um, can be kind of uh, the predominant models of thinking about how exhibitions operate in relationship to performance. So as a kind of recent example um, of the kind of theatrical um, type or typology, um, you see here two images of Rituals of Rented Island, Object Theater, Loft performance and the new psychodrama in Manhattan 1970 to 1980 a beautifully nice and um, longly and long and poetic title um, organized at the Whitney Museum of American Art by Jay Sanders and Greta Hardenstein who's here today um, and on the left you see work by John Zorn um, Jill Croson and Jack Smith and then on the right Michael Smith's work and I think what's interesting here is the kind of mise-en-scene um, that's put into uh, play by the curator and um, you know, by working to put together photographic video, filmic documentation um, with props and um, costumes, there's a, a desire to restage um, actions that happened in the past to not take them wholesale as they were, but work directly with the artist to reconfigure them in the space of the galleries. And I think that, to me, that embrace of the fact that um, to move work from one place to another, the shift in context requires um, a kind of artificial reenactment of the thing um, from its original form to the present, embraces a logic of theater that that I think historically in the context of museum exhibitions had been very much um, repressed and seen as a kind of bad object. So um, this is one kind of uh, one, one trend. And then I think the other is um, dance in the museum. I think we've probably all been to like 101 conferences, symposia, you know, read journals about dance in the museum. And so I just to add one thing in terms of these three recent or upcoming um, projects um, speak specifically about the relationship of these three artists to exhibition making. So these are not artists who are taking work that existed before that was made for a stage and putting it into a museum context. These are three artists who are making work bespoke for the space of the museum and also 
calling their work exhibitions. Um, and I think that's a really important shift. And so um, to, on the lower right, you see an image for Anna Teresa de Kiersmacher's work, Travail Arbeid, um, which opens next year at Viels um, in Belgium. And she says, in anticipation of the show, the choreographer does not simply bring a dance performance into a new kind of space, but rethinks it as nine weeks, a nine weeks long exhibition, accessible to the public and continuously performed during regular opening hours. Um, on the upper right, you see an image from Yvonne Rayner's Dance Works, which is currently on view at Raven Row in London. Um, and by performing four iconic works of hers from the um, 1960s, um, four times a day for 45 minutes, she's occupying the space of the galleries much like the way that sculpture does, so that it's a kind of continuous um, engagement with the physical location of the gallery. And then finally, um, Xavier Le Roy, um, retrospective on the left, an exhibition organized by the Tapias Foundation in Barcelona and traveling internationally to the Centre Pompidou and to the MoMA PS1 this fall, um, takes an emptied set of galleries and um, effectively uses retrospective, as it is named in the title, as a conceptual frame, this thing that you know is the kind of trope of how artists' careers are narrated, um, borrows it to use as a concept, but then turns it in uh, on itself. So um, by, instead of narrating the history of his career from the beginning to the end, he's thinking about the passage of time, the viewer entering a space, which is what initiates the performer's movement, um, to the fact of the performers being there all day, to the fact that he himself is making a work over the duration of the exhibition. And so um, considering time as a material um, for, his, for this conceptual maneuver. And so across three artists who are of different generations, working from different cultural contexts, um, who have historically made work for the stage, you see in this moment a kind of interest in making um, exhibitions. And I think what's of interest is the exhibition as a format um, for artists and curators both to think across disciplines, but to be able um, to set out a set of relationships between people and ideas, um, and then also place their work within a kind of larger cultural fabric um, that in which their work already appears, but to kind of make that explicit for an audience. And so um, to give you one example of a project that I worked on, um, Radical Presence, Black Performance in Contemporary Art, um, which was organized originally at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston by Valerie Cassell Oliver and then traveled um, to us at the Studio Museum and the Great Art Gallery and is currently on view at the Walker. Um, what to me became important about this exhibition was thinking about how the basic tropes, which are almost kind of conservative or conventional of exhibition making, the hang, sight lines, juxtaposition, adjacency, are these tools that are necessary for thinking about how performance can interact with exhibition making. And so in thinking about what is black about black performance, I was interested in not assuming that the blackness came from the fact that the people who made the work are black or the fact that the people who are performing in the work are black because as a good you know, postmodernist anti-essentialist, that would not be my way into it. So instead, <laughs> I, you know, was interested in how um, the kind of juxtaposition of artists could 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 ask us to think through relationship as a way of articulating what blackness could be, um, with kind of intergenerational lines of genealogy and history being the way that blackness might um, be constructed in the show. So here you see um, the relationship between, on the right, Lorraine O'Grady's work, and on the left, Adam Pendleton's work. Lorraine O'Grady in the early 1980s made this work, Art Is, um, which took place on the streets of Harlem, in which she took these you know, kind of very Baroque gilded frames and use them during the African American um, parade that happens every year in Harlem to frame anybody who um, would choose to appear within um, within that gold, you know, that golden frame. And so art is dot 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 becomes anybody who sits within it. And then on the left, you have Adam Pendleton's video that he made of Lorraine, um, in which she, you know, kind of sits before him. He kind of cuts between different moments of her narrating her history, kind of um, making. Um, a very explicit mashup um, and montage of her talking about the narration of her own work. And so um, in the galleries you would see to the, the image to the left and then behind it um, her work. So kind of her moment vetted through his eyes and then um, into her own. And um, 
there are many other examples. I'll just kind of jump to this other one between Derek Adams and David Hammonds. On the left, you guys might know this very iconic work of David Hammonds's Blizzard Ball Sale, in which also in the early 1980s in New York in the East Village, he sold um, snowballs for, you know, uh, from size small to extra large. And of course, you take them home and you have, <laughs> you know, this thing of nothing, which is potentially, you know, art, um, that its value comes from the fact that we give it meaning. Um, and um, um, unto itself, there is nothing there. Um, and on the right, you have Derek Adams's um, communicating with shadows. Um, I just crush a lot, which is a project he did where he re recontextualizes moments from the history of performance art post-war from the post-war period. And so, taking this image of Hammonds um, in his kind of you know very um, you know uh, kind of dapper hat, um, and then kind of making a, a new performance in front of it, which he then photographs four times. And of course, the I just crush a lot um, is a kind of pun, um, very much the way that David Hammonds himself loves a pun. Um, and so the crushing both involves the fact that he's literally crushing ice um, to make his own kind of blizzard ball sale, but then also that he's crushing on this earlier artist. And so for, for me, it's the, the kind of the touch, the, um, the kind of modes of transmission that characterize both what performance art can be, the fact that, you know, bearing testimony, the kind of um, intergenerational handing down of knowledge from one to the next um, defines that a as a way of working, but also that blackness itself can be thought of um, as kind of constructed through these moments of, you know, know, um, Oedipal or anti-Oedipal, you know, kind of your funky uncle and your cousin who, like, influence what you do um, as a way of constructing a kind of genealogy um, of what blackness is, and that the exhibition offers that as a model. So um, those are, you know, a few examples of, um, of the work that I've been up to. So thank you. So uh, Judy, um, you are the person on the panel who uh, has a performing arts organization. You're, you're a dance-centered organization. And um, you have developed a new curatorial model, which is your Platforms series. And if you could talk about the evolution of your work, how, how you entered into this platform series as a new way of working, and um, what are some of the challenges and resonances that um, this work has, particularly with the visual arts field as well. Thank you, Pam. Um, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Philip. Um, I, I want to just say something about the relationship between, or the, or let's just say our predecessors in the performing arts have already influenced the current field of contemporary visual art practice. And I want to quickly quote Carolee Thea in her introduction to On Curating, who writes, quote, among the major figures to have come of age in this cultural mil milieu, is the independent curator. Aesthetically, curators are more like theater directors, and it could be argued that they follow a performance paradigm rather than one based on the object or commodity. We could say that they are translators, movers, or creators whose material is the work of others. In any case, the role of the mediator is inescapable. The curator translates the artist's work by providing a context to enable the public's understanding. So I think we've been influencing each other for a very long time, perhaps at least 100 years or so, and, um, and that perhaps in the performing arts we just haven't been quite as um, methodical about recording best practices and projects, and um, I just also want to point out that uh, Yale Drama School has a current issue theater which is uh, entirely devoted to performing arts curation. Um, and includes the voice of uh, uh, one of uh, our great predecessors, Norman Frisch, and others. So um, this is not a new conversation, but it's a renewed conversation. Um, at Dance Space Project, uh, most of, many of you know, Dance Space Project is located at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. It was um, founded in 1974 to find, for a home for experimental artists, movement artists, who had come out of really Judson Dance Theater and Grand Union. Um, and so that is its sort of aesthetic and cultural history. Um, I just quickly developed the platform series as a way to try to um, create a format to work more in depth uh, with guest artist curators and so that those guest artist curators could also work with the, um, the artists that we were commissioning. Um, I just want to also say that I was inspired by a uh, visual art curator. I do not know him, but I have followed him for a while, Okwe and Wezar, who uh, was the first non-European curator of Documenta 11 
in Kassel, Germany, which is a very important um, uh, every five year visual art by any, or, you know, uh, exhibition, that's all I can say. Um, what he did with that was to decentralize the exhibition and began with platforms 18 months before the actual event in Kassel. And that fact, the idea that you could take your small platform, your, you know, your beautiful church in the East Village and start to think about different ways of using time and, um, and coming at um, the program from um, not just the event, not just what you see on the stage, but how you use other facets of the program and time and space to um, get to deeper ideas. He also said, a curator is not a tastemaker, but one who creates knowledge of the artist and the world in which she or he makes work. And I take that to mean the studio all the way to the sort of social, political situation that one, an artist finds herself in. Um, so just quickly, they were conceived to provide context for the overwhelming diversity of approaches to contemporary dance and performance making um, and to different ways of researching and um, approaches, aesthetics, ideas that uh, I often had a hard time art being able to articulate where where is this work coming from, and so I wanted to work with guest artists to help create frames, to, to create context around bodies of work, that um, very important work being made primarily in New York City, that's our, that's our home community, but also with national and international artists when we can. Um, the idea is, was, and still is, to activate a series of relationships between the curators, artists, writers, thinkers, um, and through that to see what we could find out, to use the, the platform not as a festival but as a, as a point of inquiry, to ask a question, and hopefully those questions will open up other questions and other possibilities. Um, we have produced nine platforms um, from 2010 until very recently. They range from uh, anywhere from three to seven or eight weeks, depending on the vision of the curator. I am the artistic director. I work very closely with the curators. Out of our conversations over many years, um, we kind of have organically developed teams around the platforms. And so in that way, although there is a, a curatorial author, um, there's also an emerging hybrid, which I also think is something we do in the performing arts. It's a hybrid curatorial model where we all play different roles in the production, um, research, manifestation and, um, and creating context for the work. Um, I thought today that um, I would just quickly go through um, one platform, which is the largest so far, curated by Ishmael Houston Jones, uh, an important experimental dance artist uh, who has been long associated with Dance Space Project. And in 1982, he curated a series called Parallels at Dance Space Project. And it uh, included artists Fred Holland, uh, Ralph Lemon, Christine Rata Jones, B.B. Miller, Blondell Cummings, uh, and, and Ish, and male. And um, he was looking at the time at experimental dance movement based work um, being made by African American artists in New York City. Uh, several years later, it toured to Paris with support from DTW's Suitcase Fund and inc then included Jawale Zahler. Um, and so the 30th anniversary of the 1982 iteration uh, was a platform that we presented. So let me just show some images here. You're going backwards. I'm going backwards. Let's see Thomas's images again. Oh, look what we missed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, the platforms, the sort of the basic um, uh, contextualizing elements that, that come with the platform are the catalogs. We've published nine to date. Um, and I just want to quickly read, I don't know if I have time for this, but Ishmael's um, introduction to the platform. Um, he says, Platform 2012 parallels begins for me with a question, with a series of questions in her groundbreaking book on the eponymous subject, The Black Dancing Body, Brenda Dixon Gottschild interviewed a wide range of people in the field, including B.B. Miller, Bill T. Jones, Gus Solomons Jr., Jawale Willijo Zoller, Meredith Monk, Ralph Lemon, Ronald K. Brown, and Wendy Perrin. Dixon Gottschild asked them to use memory, fantasy, dreams, mythology to answer the question, what images come to minds, the mind's eye when the term black dance is said? This has been my conundrum while curating this platform. How would I have answered her questions? 
For me, does black dance even exist? And assuming it does, what defines it? Is the term mainstream black dance an oxymoron? What would it mean to push beyond its, uh, the, its mainstream if it does exist? Um, just some things I want to say. Which arrow is it, this one? Uh, those are the original artists on the church at St. Mark's in the Bowery, St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. Um, it went from the original five to, in uh, 2012, uh, over 42 artists participated. Uh, it was intergenerational. Um, Ish invited uh, artists, and some are here today, um, Reggie Wilson, B.B. Miller, Jawole, um, Thomas DeFrance is here. He, he was a contributor. Um, and also invited some artists to also curate their own evenings. Uh, and so then, again, in this sort of idea of activating networks and relationships, that he would then offer someone the, the, the space and place to put their point of view into the mix. So, and this is the original poster designed by Fred Holland. This is uh, Ishmael with his mother in performance uh, at Dance Space Project in 1982. Some, this is in the catalog. I'll just go through quickly the, the Paris poster. And then we tried to get everyone together for photographs. So we have these images by Ian Douglas. I, um, um, we actually opened the platform at the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, and this was organized by Thomas Lacks. Uh, it was a conversation between Wengeshi Mutu and Ishmael Houston Jones um, about his work. Curator Will Rawls organized film showings, and this is just some performance and por portrait images. Archipimere, Akwe Akpakusili, John Ifwete. Samantha Spees and Kyle Abraham, Thomas DeFrance, Ralph Lemon and Nary Ward. Um, so, um, I don't know what time I have. Just, I didn't get to the challenges, we would be here all day, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I should stop there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's great, thank you. So, um, I'm really intrigued to just, uh, and, and wanted to point out to the group, just the, um, the level of research that goes into um, the work that uh, these curators do, and um, part of what we do in our program in our social and cultural uh, context courses is to give students that framework, um, how to ask questions, how to do research, and key to that research is the relationship with the artist. And, and I want to shift to the, um, to uh, all of you have an artist-centered practice, I believe, and I'd love to have you talk about um, what that looks like um, and, uh, and what is the process by which you um, begin to uncover uh, the environment within which to um, reveal that artist to an audience. And uh, I'll let anyone start who wants to start. We'll give you five minutes each, shall we? Well, you know, I, I alluded to it um, as a as a value in um, in functioning as a presenter um, and curator in performance. Um, I think it begins with um, really uh, attempting to gain a full understanding of an artist's work and history, um, and getting to know the artist um, as a person as well, and building relationships, um, which can take time. Um, but it, it, I think it goes all the way, not just understanding the hopes and needs and the potential of what an artist has to offer, but um, helping develop pathways for them to be able to take their work to the next level. Um, it even sometimes involves understanding the insecurities um, and the shortcomings of an artist um, and being able to be ultimately a trusted sounding board um, and um, a feedback for provider around their work. Um, this, I must say, you know, um, is not possible for in presenting a season of activities. Um, I. We use this term curating performance in my in my work at the Walker. I probably only consider my myself and our staff curating in some ways five or eight of the twenty five or so projects. Sometimes we're just presenting. There isn't really it really is an issue of time. And I think in many ways that's a big difference between the art world, the museum world, and the performing art world. We do hold standards around curating performance, which for many presenters, I think, myself included at times, feels sort of insurmountable because the eco economics are different in the presenting field. People have to do multiple jobs and, and find the time um, to 
do that research and to build those relationships with artists. And uh, so at, when I'm speaking at, um, at conferences in the presenting world, very often the questions are, where do you find that time? And I think that is a negotiation with one's own institution, with one's own you know, colleagues, wh who you work with, um, and then just making it a top priority to like spend the time to be able to do the reading um, and do the research and be in, in deep conversations with artists so that if you're commissioning a work, it, you then can allow that to uh, support a, an artist's desires to go to the next level. Increasingly, those desires are, at least at a place like the Walker, artists' interest in working in gallery spaces or working outside the frame of the theater. And that results in the need to collaborate with visual art curators. And that offers really uh, both challenges and a great deal of excitement. Um, but it's really, to, again, I think in some ways, it's helping um, build artists' projects through frameworks that open up opportunities that the artists have clearly articulated, but offering them opportunities they didn't even know they might need or want. So, um, you know, I think there are a lot of different ways into developing an idea for an event, a festival, an exhibition, and I think that you know some people start with an idea or a theory, and for me. Artists and especially choreographers have been my teachers, and so when I am allowed to have time and do have the time to be with them, I find that they inform me. They inform me about history, about ideas, a way of being in the world, um, and so I can't imagine developing a large-scale project with that is not completely informed by at least one artist on, on this kind of scale. But you know, um, so it's just the way I was taught to work. Um, my mentor was Marta Kern, and I also want to say that, you know, we have mentors and we, we're in a mentor and an apprentice system. We were talking about this yesterday in the performing arts, and so, um, and it was to start with the artist and ask them what they're thinking about and then develop the form, structure, architecture, design from there. And I think that's how I, work now is sort of listening, listening, and then it's not just a matter of let's just do everything you want to do, which would be wonderful, but what do you, what is the intention, what do you want to do, and then how can I question, uh, provoke, bring in different ideas, and so that it becomes a dynamic conversation, but um, it's the further you get away from the integrity of what the artist wants, the further you get away from the integrity of what you want to give to your audience, right? So we want to, I want to go from working with the artist and those ideas and then also bring that as close as I can, th that quality to the audience. Um, and I always say you have to hold, well, I try to hold the integrity of the audience and the integrity of the artist and that's my job. But so that's my answer to right now to that. Um, and I guess I um, made an exhibition that would kind of think <laughs> through these questions. Um, is this still working? We're turning it on. Oh, thank you. Um, so it's an exhibition called When the Stars Begin to Fall, Imagination and the American South. And I think in a lot of ways, the show was about trying to follow artists' leads um, in terms of the structure by which they were working and to build a kind of um, analogous model in the context of our space at the Studio Museum. And the project in a lot of ways began with Ralph. It seems like Ralph Lemon, many of the projects <laughs> seem to begin and end with him. But um, he was you know, doing a project in um, Little Yazoo, Mississippi, which many of you are familiar with, um, where he was working with a group of non-artists. Um, and to me, you know, obviously there's a history in kind of um, Judson, post-Judson dance of thinking about vernacular movement, but simultaneously in the visual art world, um, there's been a kind of augmentation and the interest in outsider art, which also, you know, the last Venice Biennial was um, many artists coming out of um, incarcerated, self-taught, um, and other, you know, kind of um, non-mainstream art world traditions were included in that show. And there have been a few other exhibition, major exhibitions um, of work of vernacular artists. And so trying to think through the kind of shared interest in one, working with non-professional artists, two, thinking through um, the space 
um, that exists in the kind of everyday that characterizes these two different worlds and beginning to put together these ideas that don't belong with one another. Um, and so also following Ralph's lead and his interest in the South, um, his interest in the space of religion in one of the, um, the fantastic conversations um, that Philip mentioned earlier, I had heard like Ralph talk about his, his relationship to grace. Um, and it was just kind of like, oh, grace? And you were like, wait, why? And no one is talking about grace and contemporary. It's <laughs> such a weird and, and you know, anomalous um, kind of way of thinking about, you know, um, contemporary, but I think deeply important in the way that you guys described. And then I think the, the third piece was, you know, Ralph was making a project that existed in people's homes that was not destined for a stage. And even what we see is a kind of like, you, it might look like a window, but it's also like this kind of um, shield to what actually happens there. And so I was interested in the kind of creation of these alternative exhibition or viewing spaces and how I, and then I began to look, and there are many, many artists coming out of theater, dance, and music who were doing something similar in relationship to these ideas of, you know, kind of spiritual space um, to the South as a kind of um, home or point of origin in a fraught way, um, and also um, the kind of idea of vernacular or local culture. And so I began to make this exhibition that was really an attempt to think through how artists had acted as not only curators, but also institution makers in different ways. Um, and bringing together folks, many of whom are kind of at the center of a commercial visual art world, folks like David Hammonds, um, Carrie James Marshall, Theaster Gates, um, you can see Carrie's paintings, the Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein here, and um, David's um, bottles also on view here. And so these are artists who've kind of created their own museums or their own cultural spaces for, you know, Carrie uh, making a museum effectively of black types. Um, and for Theaster, um, making his own space in the south side of Chicago. Similarly to how somebody like Ralph or Jacoby Satterwhite, who's the artist that made this installation, um, that you know is a collaboration between himself and his mother, Patricia Satterwhite, who's been in, uh, kind of um, diagnosed with schizophrenia and making work in her home in Columbia, South Carolina for the last 18 years, and kind of using her home effectively as a space to not only make art but also to preserve and show it which is like what I do so I, I was trying to figure out how um, these artists were constructing these um, using the logics of a museum in its most fundamental form to make their own kinds of exhibition spaces and so you know I quite literally you know the same way that these artists are kind of bringing together material that um, comes from many different cultural origins and is organized according to um, a variety of hierarchies use that as a kind of ready-made um, conceptual structure that then I would insert these different artists um, some of whom have been categorized as outsiders others of whom come out of painting and sculpture and yet others come out of the performing arts. Um, and that's how I got to this show. So I think my way of being artist-centered is to um, oftentimes uh, kind of come as close to people's practices um, without touching them so that it's like a way of not necessarily mimicking them but kind of creating this parallel track by which people can kind of come to understand what they're doing because I'm just, you know, hopefully like this kind of clean whistle vessel to <laughs> give them um, a, a platform. Um, I, I want to have time for you to ask each other a question and then um, hear from the audience. But I, I, I do want to just ask, how do you balance the care and uh, concern for the artist with the needs of the community and, um, you know, the board of trustees and, you know, all of the demands that, that come to you um, in, in marrying, as you said, the integrity of the audience with the integrity of the artist? Okay, so this is a great example of just that. So as part of this <laughs> exhibition, um, Courtesy of the Artist, which is a duo of Malik Gaines and Alex Sagade, who were formerly known as My Barbarian. Um, so Courtesy of the Artist, as you guys probably know, at the bottom of any object label, you see like Courtesy of the Artist, so it's kind of very tongue in cheek. And it's a way of them um, to kind of build this collective by which anybody can kind of um, join. And so I had a studio visit with them and they decided that they wanted to stage um, a Civil War reenactment um, at the Studio Museum in Harlem and um, as part of the Civil War reenactment as you can see here um, they asked um, a, a variety of artists to join them um, Niv Acosta who's a you know a contemporary dancer and choreographer um, 
here in the kind of center uh, bottom, you see the 38th um, colored regiment. So it's a troop of folks who do reenactments, not at all connected to any contemporary art world, dance, theater, otherwise. And then they asked um, Matina Roberts um, to uh, perform. And on the left, you see her wearing um, Confederate flag singing Dixie, or rather playing Dixie on her um, tenor sax. And so if you can imagine like a nice, beautiful Saturday afternoon in Harlem in our courtyard, she's wearing this and playing Dixie for anybody to hear. So obviously a lot of, you know, uh, troubled, vexed material, but it's all material that's in um, the, you know, history of this country and um, that is, a, you know, they, they used a kind of uh, a, a, book, a book of scores and kind of asked people to interpret different scores. So it's, um, it's all, you know, it's all, it's all readily available. And so I think, you know, this was a huge question of like, what does it mean for us to be presenting this? How do we take something that's meant to be not necessarily ironic, because I don't think that they're working through irony. I think that they're there's something actually really earnest about what they're doing, uh, but there's something perverse, clearly, in what they're doing. And so how do you allow for the space for an artist to kind of think through the critical function of perverse you know, action, um, but also like for folks who are like, what the, what, why are you playing? You know, the audience was a, v you know, we wanted to make sure that the audience was um, a wide and varied audience, folks who knew their work, but also people who happened to just, you know, come in on a Saturday um, uh, and wanted to check out what was going on. So we decided to, you know, make um, a very clear handout that would like, you know, describe the, all the different um, tents that they made. You know, they had like the Gettysburg tent, um, and be able to give a context to what they would be seeing, um, you know, what the the kind of um, meaning of reana reanimating this material would be, um, and then worked with all of our security guards and worked with um, fantastic. Um, Tim uh, Timothy Stockton, a guy who, you know, fantastic visitor services person who kind of when you walk into the museum is the first person that you greet. Anybody who's been to the studio museum knows him. Um, and so kind of do these, you know, very close one-on-ones to make sure that no matter how people were coming into this material, they would have you know, a kind of context to um, allow for them to understand the stakes of what was happening, but also push them a little bit um, to feel uncomfortable about, you know, what the stakes of, his, you know, what, when you're historically reenacting American history, what's, you know, what's at play? You know, I, I, I put um, a lot of stock in the notion of being um, a translator and uh, an advocate. So, um, uh, you know, Fortunately, the Walker part of the mission is to support artists and new forms and um, development of creative expression in new ways. However, there's, that doesn't mean that when artists want to f put their work out in a certain way, it's not going to—it's—it's um, it's not going to require a lot of care w in conversation with audiences, with community partners, with the institution at large, especially when the um, artists say like Sarah, want to really stretch the boundaries of what is even possible within an institution. So then, you know, I think whether the, it's a part of a curating process or just an effective um, conduit catalyst um, that one is playing, um, it's really a process of building, understanding, um, context, um, giving people handles, building excitement um, so that an artist doesn't walk into a situation where they're just met with um, bafflement or opposition. Um, and so that really, I think, is a critical role of the, of the curator in performance. Just quickly, I have presented and curated in the middle of the country in Colorado for most of my career where most people in the audience were not professional artists, very intelligent, but not, not in the know. And now I'm in New York at Dance Space Project and walking into a situation where m much of the audience are very well educated and well versed in dance and contemporary performance. So, but the underlying um, qualities, skills to develop are, as Sam mentioned earlier, this listening, and as you mentioned earlier, empathy. Um, I can, you know, it, it actually during parallels, we, we were fortunate and we got great press which also meant that suddenly we had people coming who had just read about something in the newspaper, and um, we usually don't get the under 18 set at Dance Space Project, but there were you know, mothers and coming with children, and so I found myself in the situation of really needing to reach out and engage with them one-on-one -on -one and, and talk to them about what they might be seeing. And, um, but I think those qual I mean, I don't think you can ever rest on a 
we can't be removed even if we're not always in the room for the performance. Some one of our people, our staff, <laughs> are, are there, and so there's not a remove, and so to, 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 to sort of cultivate a heightened state of uh, listening and, and, and empathy to both sides without apologizing for the work, but w w while respecting the audience, I think mm -hmm. is critical. Do uh, any of you want to go deeper on something that one of the other of you said, or ask a question uh, before we turn it over to the group? Um, you know, Thomas and I had an, a, a conversation, which you didn't really quite finish last night, so I'm just going to pick up where we were. <laughs> and it was about some of the things that are brought up around the difference of curating an exhibition and curating, say, a festival or a performance season or a single event is the role of the curator as a co-creator, as a, as a kind of equal partner in the construction of meaning. Um, and I wondered, Thomas, if you would want to talk about how you view the role, your role as a curator in relationship to artists around what you're bringing to the framing and the, the sort of trans the, the event itself on a creative level. And do you see that differently when you go to see performing art events in New York and how that you know, functions? Um, well, I think that, um, you know, the, the term curating is something that, you know, is like has become so like ubiquitous <laughs> so that like, you know, you can like curate your, you know, Starbucks like coffee or whatever, like something like just so um, unimportant. But so it, what's exciting is the kind of um, rigor and distinction that I think the projects that um, you know have been around the table ICPP have articulated in terms of what that thing can mean so it's not just like oh this is a thing that we associate with value uh, you know curating is about distinction and that distinction is about evaluation and also giving things worth that are monetary so it's not just barring that part although of course that is of interest and all the ways that interest plays out um, to artists and to curators um, but I do think that um, you know the there's um, I think in in the there's something that you know the kind of authorial auteur model of curatorial work that has become predominant um, in terms of how curators are able to make careers in the visual arts world um, that I think there's a nice kind of pushback on that in terms of the emphasis on collaboration and collectivity that comes out of working in a you know performing arts venue where you are kind of um, working to marshal and channel energies from a number of different people so it's not just like oh here I am that kind of impresario of ideas and uh, I'm able to kind of you know bring all this together according to some device that is only my own um, and so I think that um, that's perhaps the that that place of kind of nice synergy where there's a commitment to kind of articulating somebody else's vision um, but also doing it in a way that is you know highly specific and context driven with the assumption that you know it doesn't a, a context doesn't make itself um, and so that your role is to kind of generate that One more question uh, before we turn it over. Anyone have one? Okay. Well, I do have a question. Yes. Okay, um, I do want to hear you talking to talk more about Sarah Mitchell's and Philip. I mean, not only because Philip was featured in the work, but also because, as many of you guys know, but also because I think, you know, um, in relationship to many things, the fact that museums in New York and on the East Coast are like kind of constantly making new buildings, and that was at the beginning of your new building, but it was also a kind of, you know, a critique in some ways of that space um, that engaged folks outside of just the Walker's audience, um, which could be called social engaged practice by some people, but, you know, comes out of a history of performance and choreography. Can you just talk about the project and how you guys came to work together and how she let how you let her do what she did there? Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> um, it's been nine years, so I think uh, I, I've, I've recovered. <laughs> but <laughs> actually, it was the start of a relationship. It was like really unusual for us because we um, launched with an ambitious, really large-scale, ambitious project, and it came out of a desire when we built this new building. The Walker had never had its own formal theatrical theater space before, and to open the first full season. I wanted to do something kind of send a signal and do something somewhat perverse around sending the signal that even though we have this beautiful theater that a lot of money was spent on, we're not going to be constrained by just creating work for and in the theater. Mm -hmm. And so we asked Sarah, 
who I knew from watching her previous work, had a truly a sort of brilliant um, architectural sensibility around her use of space to um, jump in and look at the plans that Herzog and Demeron were, were coming up with for the new building and to create something that would perhaps celebrate, perhaps critique, or in some ways amplify the designs of the building. We actually um, flew her to Basel to meet with Herzog and Demeron um, when the, well, long before the building even was up, and she started devising plans around animating the entire building and actually, because Sarah builds work that it pulls from her own history and is kind of self-referential, she started this daylight project at PS122. Then she wanted to build PS122 on the stage of the walker, jumping from my, my idea that let's not just make a, a piece for the theater. And so we built, she built these big structures that had the exact same dimensions as the space at PS122 situated on the stage with no one in the seats except in the balcony and then on platforms on the stage so any viewer would only see part of what was going on. Then she worked with 52 local young women age 12 to 18 um, to shape them rigorously. When she went into the first rehearsal with them, we pulled together all these students, dance students. She said, you may not think you're professionals, but by the end of working with me, you're going to be better than the dancers at the Lyon Opera Bell. <laughs> they were very uh, small gestures that she had them placed throughout the building, as you saw, on the lawn, um, across all the public spaces. Um, and um, the bit of, the, um, of what she wanted to do, too, was she wanted to sort of gently um, make a statement about the relationship at that time between the the different departments and somewhat something that she viewed as something of a hierarchy around visual art, performing art, and film video. And so she was working with her, vi her visual art collaborator, Claude Wampler, and took some snapshots of different staff members at the Walker. And she worked with art students really away from the Walker without us really even knowing or realizing um, that, and turned into public panels eight feet high and four feet wide of portraits of people who worked at the Walker, which was a big challenge for me because so many of them were of me. And, uh, <laughs> and she thought that was great and really funny. Um, uh, but they also happened to be coming in at a time when we had a Chuck Close self-portrait show up at the Walker. And they, so we had to install them every day of the performance and then take them back down during the gallery hours because they weren't real art. And so, um, <laughs> So it was complicated. And then she had a portrait of Kathy Halbreis, the director at the time, and Richard Flood, our chief curator. And they were placed like up the lawn and then in someone's front lawn, <laughs> far away from the uh, setting. So there was this whole kind of ironic and interesting critique. She wanted to foreground uh, the curators in performance and the staff in performing arts because she felt they were often invisible and also because she sees her curators as collaborators the way she does with Jay Sanders at, you know, on the new piece. This project um, was not the end of a relationship, it was the start. We, that led us, I became such a fan even though there were moments of terror um, <laughs> that uh, we immediately commissioned the next piece, Devotion, and then we're a co-commissioner and really involved in the development of our newest piece with the Whitney um, that's gonna come to us and open our fall 2015 season. Um, but to the Kathy Halbreich and the entire Walker staff and the visual art department staff, they were totally down with the notion. They, they got it, they were, they were cool with it, we were able to take over the entire building, and I think it really did send a message, even though there were mixed responses. Some were ecstatic about the piece, some felt like they only saw a third of it, what the hell was going on. Um, that, um, that was a real testament to the Walker's willingness for self-critique and also to give artists really ambitious opportunities to, to work on a very large scale. And I, it did what I had hoped, which was to say, yes, we have this beautiful theater, but that's not, all we're, that's the, not the only place we're gonna be working. Um, and just an end note to that, uh, interesting, this is an art world kind of little nuance that's kind of interesting. So um, we're starting to collect um, pieces out of the performing art history. In fact, some of you may know we, we acquired and are thrilled about acquiring the entire collection of Merce Cunningham sets, props, and costumes um, two years ago. And we have co acquired work for our permanent visual art collection um, from Meredith Monk and Ralph Lemon and uh, Trisha Brown. Um, but these portraits who were done by students 
and over supervised by uh, Claude Wampler, I, w I thought, uh, you know, we, we just had to throw them out because they were meant for, um, you know, we don't have storage space. I never even thought of them as art. Nobody did at the time. But my family insisted that we put a few in the garage at my house. <laughs> So our neighbors think I'm this completely self-absorbed uh, person every time the garage door opens. Um, and finally it was time to clear the garage and one other member of the, of the Walker staff had one of Diana Kim who was working on the project at the time on my staff. And so we're all wondering now in this age, so I sent pictures of you know, them to our visual art folks and, and they said, well, we're not exactly sure because it's, you know, it wasn't Sarah's own hand and things like that, whether they really are right for the visual art collection. But then I mentioned it to our archivist and she said, absolutely. So we, we, they are now part of the archive collection at the Walker. And someday, who knows, maybe they'll enter into the permanent collection as well. So that's just a, sort of how do we collect this work? And it's the, an evolving question as we move forward. <coughs> That's a long, that, sorry, that's a long story. No, I, that's what, I was looking for the end with the, you know, the garage door coming out. <laughs> so um, questions about curating as a verb, about artist center practice, relationship with community. What has this sparked for you? Yes, Randy. repeat the question, uh, just I, I will summarize it. Um, this is Randy Fippinger speaking from Williams College. Uh, balancing in a four-year uh, program, uh, looking back, looking at contemporary work, um, what are your thoughts? Anyone? Sure. Um, so we've uh, uh, developed two sort of historic platforms that relate very specifically to dance space projects history. Uh, what I tend to do as, as a practice is when I sort of enter in an organization or an institution or a city, oh, sort of go into the history so I have a sense of it and keep that sort of a, an awareness of that. But let's just say with um, Parallels or Judson Now, the question I ask when looking at history is what's relevant about this history now? Well, you know, why history is wonderful, but if we're in the, this live work in this current moment and what makes this urgent now? Why is it relevant? Why is it important? So I constantly run that history through that kind of um, self-reflexive um, uh, practice all the time and then bring that to um, to the curators I'm working with. Um, right now I'm working with Claudia Larocco and I won't go into what the platform is but it is rooted in 1974, New York City 1974 and there's certain um, artists that come up that we know, Cunningham, Balanchine, Grand Union, and so we keep saying, but why is this relevant now and what else was going on in 1974 then that's important and still a part of our history now. And so it's a constant, um, it's part of our process to sort of play, activate history but not be beholden to history, to problematize history. History is a verb. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're making history, we're engaged in history. It's never something outside of us we are a part of the past history and making the future history. Yes, we're gonna use microphones and um, can you say your name before you ask your question, please? Sure, my name is Michelle Steinwald. My question has to do with um, springing off of something Thomas talked about with the empty whistle or the clean whistle and at the same time paralleling an artist process and I'm wondering, for all three of you, where are some of the values that you can't help but hold on to personally hmm. as you are being that conduit for the artist work? And how do you um, make that known to the artists or the institutions or audiences that you're working with? I guess the question is directed to me. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, let's see. I think, you know, I, I say that, but it, it might be, I, I might say it like totally um, disingenuously about the clean whistle, because I think in a lot of ways, 
you know, who we are and our own sense of subjectivity is so, you know, so informs who and what we do. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways that really dovetails what Judy just said about the kind of relationship to um, how history is manifest in the present um, and how, you know, we be kind of become these, uh, it, it's really like through our own kind of subjective lens that we're able to articulate what this thing in the past was because it has this relationship to a collective of folks who are here now. Um, I think in a lot of ways the issues that face our field in relationship to questions of representation, um, which you know have been highlighted in a number of different moments, you know, the last Whitney Biennial, um, where there was this kind of withdrawal by the Yams Collective around issues of racial representation in the show, um, highlights a far greater problem around you know representation of um, folks of color in the field, and I think that this this question um, kind of emphasizes the need for. Um, theoretical positions around feminism, um, around kind of black radical critique um, to continue to be front loaded even if they might feel like historical relics and there are ways to um, make them incredibly of our moment. And so I think that, you know, kind of thinking about what, you know, these identitarian positions mean in our moment, e even if they're not like race, class, gender that we all know from school, but about like geographical identity and, you know, kind of sightedness, um, which clearly all the projects that we've talked about I think also speak to um, are ways to vet our sense of self um, through what the material is that we're presenting. I think you raise a very important uh, question, Michelle. We have a course, um, as you know, uh, Perspectives on Performances Culture, which is taught by a Wesleyan faculty member, Nicole Stanton, in the dance department. And it really asks our students to understand what are those biases, what are, how, how are, what is their lens through which they are seeing work. And I think it's an essential part of our path is to um, be able to put our finger on that. So, yes, another question, please. Uh, Christy Bolingbroke from ODC in San Francisco, and um, I'm really curious in the examples that you provided or maybe in other examples, you know, in the work that we do in the deep research uh, and knowing your community and I appreciate your question, Pam, about, you know, how do you also cultivate those relationships and protect and foster them with your stakeholders. Um, how else have you been able to make sure that you're not just doing really great work in your own backyard, that you are uh, contributing to the national dialogue that you are advocating for these artists on a larger scale or platform and especially because I appreciate that all of you work on very different scales too. I, I think that's um, you know the performing art world is tends to be so collaborative um, um, uh, but it, it's really um, I think uh, understanding one's own role as a potential advocate uh, for artists nationally, so that when you get behind projects, to be to be sending information and talking to colleagues at every opportunity, and uh, presenting the work of artists you believe in in national forums and regional forums, and um, just trying to, um, re I mean, just having the understanding that. Uh, a support, of, particularly of a performing artist, has to extend beyond your own city and your own theater or, or space because their work needs to be supported usually, almost always uh, on some kind of greater national level. Um, and I think one of the things I love about having grown up in the presenting world is how collaborative, by sort of by fiat or by necessity, I think the, the say the dance presenting world is because no one can afford to solely commission a work or produce a work, and people just tend to share um, information, values, uh, uh, um, passions, and uh, so that um, I think becomes kind of an assumption or a given. Like you're you're gonna just be advocating in every way you can for artists that you believe in and are supporting um, in the development of your work. Can I say a little about that? Um, you know, advocacy is constant, and and unfortunately, and, and, and it's does, it's not always one to one. Like you can advocate for an artist or a project, and no one, you know, it doesn't right. it hasn't have any traction. And but um, but I do think that the how we've been trying to approach it is 
who we invite into the room to be a part of the project, who we invite onto panels or you know, special invitations to see work that who are, we, and this is not a perfect system and it's not, I, you know, I'm not able to do this all of the time, but when possible to make sure there are 10 people who can really understand this work so that by bringing people together, it has like an effect out, like that, again, like the constellation or network, it's not all at once, but hopefully it can build some momentum for an artist or, or, or a group of artists. Um, so I think it's a kind of live participation that has reverberations into the future. Yolanda. Hi, I'm Yolanda from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Uh, the last question was so interesting to me because I think one of the great responsibilities as a curator in the context of a museum like ours is that if we're really caring, in Philip's word, for the artist's work, our role increasingly is important in the process and the available resources, and that gets very tricky because unlike visual art curators where there's a, it seems to me, a, a clearer line where the artist is making the work and then the engagement begins with the curator, we delve a certain amount of um, power in, in providing resources that beyond the kind of work that can be without special lighting or, or specific architecture, it, it's important. So I think that the question about advocacy is also, at least in a city like Chicago, um, <coughs> providing access to artists who normally actually don't have that advocacy in the city itself. Mm. To create work and take it and push it and coordinate it to a different level. And I increasingly see that as a role. Do you see that in your situations? I think it's a different, uh, quite a different situation outside of New York City than it is inside. And I think that um, every uh, presenting institution um, has to figure out what their relationship is with their own uh, creative local community. Um, I know at the Walker, even though the, the bulk of the work we do is with national and international artists, it's such a vital, interesting scene, particularly in dance, but in music as well, that we really try to consciously build um, some frames and some systems of support, and lately, each season, um, really get a full-fledged equal commit commitment of commissioning and development resources to at least one major new dance theater project on the season each year from the Twin Cities community um, and create uh, systems for music support. Um, but I know, I think that's an evolving value in some ways. There used to be a day, I think, where presenters felt like it's somehow uh, the work of their local community um, uh, was something that wasn't their responsibility. I think there's still some, you know, a number of presenters who feel that or that it's not of the standard of what they want to be working with. And I think that my personal feeling is that unless you're in some ways engaged and in conversation with and watching the work of artists in your own home community, and I think that's increasingly um, essential, you're not really fully doing your job. So um, anyway, that's just my take on it, but I know it can be it can be hard because there are many artists in one's own home community and you know what's the process of evaluation and selection and um, how do you work with artists you respect but can't present or, or commission and things like that. Those are all big questions we continue to you know, struggle with. Uh, Mariah Weathers, um, formerly recently, uh, International Project Director at New York Live Arts and now an independent uh, freelance consultant for international projects. Um, my question, because I've heard in the literature around um, ICPP and some references when you're we talking about international and global, um, so how, um, how does the global landscape inform your work, or does it, I guess, if it does, how does it? Um, and what, if any, bridges do you feel like need to be built in terms of on the international uh, field? Um, in terms of what's happening now here, what's happening abroad, and if there's room for those things to come together in some way. Just quickly, I think we don't have much of a budget for international work that impacts how much we present, but when we do, I tend to, again, work within a network of artists working in the United States and working with others. It's been prim primarily European artists, although I 
would love to work more with Latin American artists and and, and other continents, uh, you know, West Africa. But we just haven't had the budget. But when we do present it, usually. Th I found that when it just brought someone that I loved and no one knew them, they were not seen or didn't come to see them. people didn't come to see the work. So I found that if I could work with an artist who had a relationship, that then you can start to build an audience for that work and have a sort of more artist to artist exchange. But it's it's small in my case right now. Um, about fifteen or twenty years ago, the Walker changed its um, part of its mission statement from being internationally engaged to globally. And it doesn't sound like much of a difference, but the thought was that historically we looked mostly to Europe and uh, to the coasts of the U.S. And that this was a really conscious effort um, to really be aware of creative centers around the world. And uh, we did this big exhibition, How Latitudes Become Forms, which included a lot of performing art activity. And it was a turning point for us. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it requires a consciousness of like continuing to be where do, where, how do I get to places that normally um, wouldn't be on the so-called trade routes. And so I try to make at least one, if not two, uh, trips um, internationally outside of Europe each year for just on, on a basis of research. Um, I think global presenting is becoming, is, has become more challenging because of costs and, and immigration and taxes and everything else. Um, but I, I feel like um, there are, there is a, uh, a network of, of, of presenting institutions in the U.S. committed to international and global work. Um, and but it just takes it takes so much time. I, I've found um, we're involved in two international projects as part of our Out There Festival of Alternative Performance Work, and neither have booking agents or. Um, man managements to effectively get a tour to the U.S. So it literally is a conference call every three weeks with seven institutions, <laughs> Yolanda knows about this, um, organizing everything from travel itineraries to visas to freight costs to everything. So we sort of are be become um, self producers really of the international touring work and advocates so that you can get other colleagues to help share the really extensive international travel costs which those of you involved in this work know that international airfares have just really climbed and it's the costs continue to be um, challenging to be able to get um, international work here but I think it's pretty essential if we view ourselves um, like at the walkers being a play a window something on contemporary expression ar around the world how do we not end up gravitating just to Europe and um, we're part of something called the uh, African Consortium we helped uh, be one of the founding members where we're really committed to contemporary particularly dance but contemporary performance work coming out of the continent of Africa and we have annual meetings on the continent and things like that and so we're just we're, you know trying to make those efforts but time is again a, a real limiting factor of how how thin can one be spread I think it's a great question Mariah and hopefully I think we can talk about it in our table groups I think in some ways it's a rearticulation of the last two questions around the relationship of the local to the global and then also even of Michelle's question around kind of specificity and finding a way to be ambitious and engaged in questions that of course in our hyper mediated world are like simultaneous but also articulated through a very particular point of view um, I think you know, in terms of kind of approaching this question, one idea um, that um, a curator at the Perez Museum, um, Tobias, um, you know, talked about recently at a new museum conference was um, strategic regionalism, right. which I think is an interesting way to approach the kind of question of the global. So I think, you know, kind of drawing on the idea of strategic essentialism, um, you know, Gayatri Spivak kind of term, um, and then critical regionalism, um, which kind of emerges from, you know, 90s architectural theory, thinking about ways that we can build networks that are not necessarily like a little bit of here, a little bit of there, a little bit of down here, and like then here you go, like, you know, present it as some kind of like authentic, you know, like leveling of everything that's happening in the world, but also not assuming that people are working in like completely autonomous zones and that they're, you know, like what's happening in one part of the world is necessarily affecting other parts of the world, but then 
finding a middle place between that, and I think that maybe is some of the things that you've been up to in terms of your own interests um, in the relationship of folks on the continent of Africa to um, kind of you know New York and American um, dance scene. So I think finding you know as Judy's discussing like these these ways of like kind of shuttling between different locations that make meaning and articulate how one place historically has influenced another place, um, and thinking about for us together maybe how ICPP given the kind of um, resources that we have and ambitions that we have can do that in, in dynamic ways. And I think another consideration is, um, you know, in addition to all the difficulty that, that we have with visas, expense, et cetera, there's a, a, la a knowledge gap among a lot of performing arts presenters in terms of being comfortable with presenting uh, international work. And I think we have to reveal to our field the experts that we have and how generous those experts are. And I'm thinking of Rachel Cooper um, of the Asia Society yeah. who's here today who's just done so much to help all of us in uh, being able to uh, bring work from Asia to this country. And and um, I think that's another sort of reason for being for, for uh, a, a kind of network like ICPP is to know where those pockets of expertise are. Alicia Adams at the Kennedy Center, Japan Society, we have Lara Moans here today. So, you know, those resources are there, uh, and I think it's being able to call upon those people for support. And I think it is something that, that funders are recognizing is a really yep. missing element, and I, I want to acknowledge the Mellon Foundation and Susan, but you know, we, we met a number of years ago and said, this is really a, a big challenge for us, not just at the Walker, but in, in nationally. And so the support of the ability to go out and do some research and be able to support a couple of projects each year that are of an ambitious scale to come into the states and have that kind of impact is, is you know, has been critically a big, a big important um, um, aspect for us. Uh, over here, Beth. Uh, Beth Allen. Uh, I um, sort of to pick up on various strands of the conversation that have um, come up, all of you have sort of alluded to various administrative challenges, um, whether that's marketing or fundraising or um, time management um, questions about archives. Um, and I was wondering if uh, you could sort of talk a little bit about um, balancing the curatorial um, you know, your curatorial work with the administrative challenges of working in the different types of institutions you work with. Um, I'm, uh, I guess I'm curious to the extent to which you feel that your curatorial work informs the way in which you work um, within your institutions, advocate within your institutions, um, specifically. I will say that the, um way that we've organized the platforms in these small sort of groups, teams, um, where, you know, I mean, Lydia Bell is here, she's been a part of those, she's been managing editor, and, and we have, sometimes if we're lucky, we get have a, a research fellow, sometimes they're volunteers, sometimes we can give them an honorarium, but I think that way of working has then informed us as a staff, and so that we have then moved to have if not everyone's involved curatorially, at least we're trying to work, we're very small, so we can do this, but um, so that everyone is sort of informed about the program and can weigh in and we have discussions about it and we're trying to really create an environment where we are all content providers, if you will, we're, you know, the finance manager is as knowledgeable about what's happening so that we're all advocates for the work, and so that's what we're trying to build, because, um, and um, I think it's working, I, I don't want to put it out there as like a model, it's just sort of a way of like translating or transferring what we're learning from working with artists and writers and scholars and bringing that into an administrative environment a little bit more, so it's not the separation between marketing and development, and the marketing person gets all the information at the end, and just really, trying hard to break that down a little bit. I also, you know, I, th I think uh, picking one's shots, uh, especially the, the presenting world I'm, I alluded to before, you know, I think presenters are often expected to be great curators, great uh, finance people, fundraisers, marketing people, you know, and you're sort of juggling all these things all the time. And so I, I know that our approach was this, sometimes we're just presenting, 
sometimes we are commissioning and presenting, sometimes we're developing a project and commissioning and presenting, and sometimes we're all, almost all in, come as close to a producer as possible, but it, understanding what, this, what the capacities are and how far one can push one's institution, but also figuring out ways to effectively advocate, especially in large institutions, for one's own slice of the pie, and that, that's not so much dollars, but it's as much attention, and, um, and uh, just everyone's busy, and it's not that people don't care, but it's like, how do you get people's attention, and that you know this thing matters, and sometimes it's about, it's only these two things, not these 12 things, you know, so we kind of have to prioritize internally in our staff, which are the things that we know are really going to resonate within our institution. The other things we'll still present, and we'll still be supportive of, but we know we'll probably only get the cover of the Walker magazine w once or twice a year, you know, or whatever that is. So we have to be really strategic about um, kind of creating, um, the, you know, picking those those spots to, to advocate for. And I guess I would just add that I think a lot of what I know about this I've actually learned from Judy and her team at Dance Space Project. I think that in a lot of ways, the you know, to take a lean operation and the the platforms themselves have kind of been this amazing marketing engine. Yeah. Um, so even though they're kind of built with deep integrity towards artistic vision, there are these things that get you know like you know front page of the art section, right. in the New York Times um, announcements. So I think finding ways to really see every aspect of what happens in the museum or in and performing arts space as um, kind of curatorial in a way, um, obviously coming out of a commitment to programs, but then, you know, like even how one like goes about where one throws out the trash is like also a kind of curatorial decision in a way because it informs meaning as people walk into a space. Um, and so I think, you know, obviously where one sits in relationship to other people can inform how many decisions one can make around this thing. So make friends and then hope that <laughs> you know people who make those decisions will listen to your thoughts about them. And Kathy Edwards in the back. Thank you. Um, Kathy Edwards from the Arts and Ideas Festival. I was sort of struck by um, Philip's story of the Sarah Mitchelson experience and also uh, I think at the beginning of Thomas's presentation he talked about being less interested in the distinctions between kind of curating uh, performance versus uh, visual practice artists and and I wondered do you think there's a different quality to curatorial practice as relates to um, a need to be comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty maybe or the unknown when it comes to curating performance as opposed to visual arts or am I getting caught in a trap that is less about the form and more about maybe whether the artist is being commissioned to create something so maybe that cuts across both visual and performative uh, curation or is it about the contemporary nature of an artistic debate you referred to the yams um, in particular so I just would love your thoughts on those questions thank you Well, I, I would just say yes, absolutely. I, in fact, I had it on my list of like curating performance, like comfort with ambiguity, verging on um, uh, you know uh, acceptance of um, of a potential disaster, um, and you know. Um, <laughs> Because you, you put your faith in artists and then it's a brand, especially with commissions, it's a brand new work. You do everything you can to make it successful, but you know so, sometimes it simply won't be. And so, and I, I think that um, in contemporary art centers or contemporary uh, institutions, that uh, has to be something of a given. Um, I, I'd love to hear from Thomas too about that because exhibitions tend to be more fully set, although these days as they're more and more performative work built into an exhibition, there's more open questions about how those things will go, but that question of um, the unexpected and the ambiguous, um, how that works in gallery settings. No, I definitely think that, you know, I imagine that the folks who are in this room are different from if, if this was coming out of like a museum world conversation or 
by disposition and personality a little bit different and more improvisatory even if we just think about like our own process of getting to today you know right. we were very much kind of thinking together and on our feet um, to hope that this would be something that would kind of um, be relevant to the things that we're thinking about so I think that the nature of like who's in this room means that some of us are I think inherently more predisposed to the unknown of what might happen when you get on a stage because anything can happen versus <laughs> like obviously you know horrible things happen you know in the context of installing work on a wall but you can make an exhibition design and you have the you know art handlers put it where it goes and if you don't like it you move it to the left and then a week later <laughs> you know all those things it's just like a different you know I think that there's a kind of um, yeah personality of just from even knowing people here um, but with that said I do think um, that uh, it's our role to build space out for ambiguity and the unknown I think that's like our as at, w whether it's commissioning new work which I, when it becomes like deeply deeply integral because there's quite literally no one knows it's gonna go down um, to you know just kind of um, working closely with artists more generally to kind of carving out that space of um, potential failure and experimentation and a lot of that goes back to what Philip I think was saying earlier around how we support artists like and through like neurosis and through insecurity like that's really our job is like that kind of you know like you know curator psychoanalyst type of thing so I think um, I do think that you know the the field of intersecting um, topics that we're here, you know, performance, um, commissioning the contemporary, um, even political, like I think what, how we can define political work is about um, the kind of potential of things not necessarily, their meaning not being self-evident. Um, and that's all the more reason that we can kind of, you know, support artists and give some touchstones to making um, what we do see and what is meant to be objectively clear, um, uh, transparent to an audience. I want to jump in here because I th something I think about is the pressure of curating commissions, uh, especially in, in you know the density it, in New York City. Um, some of the mid-sized dance um, uh, presenters uh, are you know up to 16 to 20 new works a year. And actually, one of the reasons I felt that I wanted to put a frame around some of the work was. Um, that's a that's a big risk, um, and and so how do you come at that curatorially? Aside from the, your trust and and dialogue with the artist and interest in their ideas and wanting to support the work, then curatorially, how do you shape that? How do you give that context? And I uh, I just want to mention that because when I um, worked with Trajal Harrell, who curated a platform 2010, certain difficulty, certain joy. Almost every piece he curated, he had seen. The whole, I mean, it was very specific, and that is a different kind of curatorial approach. There were a couple of commissions in there, I think probably prompted by me, I think he, <laughs> he um, but through our conversations, maybe not, but um, so I, just, I think that's a good distinct, something to point out, and, um, and then also I was just thinking about, um, you know, Okwi Akpakwasili was performing and her work is very much her presence, her uh, virtuosity, and then when she gets the flu, you know, the <laughs> you know, she's not right. there, and so There's not know, an the stagnant work of art <laughs> is not going to, you know, you really have to be there in that situation with that human being and get through that moment first, and then the art comes second, it's just something that I think we've all dealt with, and yeah, I thought I'd just share that. I think it's come to the end of our time, so I uh, want to thank our panelists for their uh, frank and thoughtful remarks, and thank you. <laughs> I'm going to invite Sam to walk us through the next section. You go ahead and walk us through the next. Okay, section. so now the balance of the, uh, of the, the convening both today and tomorrow shifts to really us hearing your voices. So, um, you know, in addition to Christy talking about her work in the, at, a, at a large university on the West Coast and Ralph this evening, lunch today, and then the two panels this afternoon that remain are really for uh, giving us an opportunity to hear from you. And I think, you know, there are, um, there are many rooms in our mother's house. And, um, you know, I think we all believe that artists have the 
power to create transformative experiences, and we know that audiences have an appetite to both participate in the creation of these experiences or the reception of them. And you know what we're you know all of us here today play a role in um, building and sustaining the bridges between the power of creation and the power of reception. And I think um, we just want to hear from you what you know how you do it and how you'd like to do it um, and how in a sense we can be as I said earlier useful in building stronger bridges um, in the future so when you go to your tables um, one of the great things about this program is the real collaboration between you know, you know Wesleyan faculty and guest faculty and so at most tables you will see a manifestation of that There'll be, you know, representation. There'll be two representatives from our program at each table who will facilitate a conversation, um, and then they will ask one uh, individual um, from that table um, to represent the conversation at lunch um, in panel two. You know, the panel that immediately following lunch. Four of those tables, you know, tables one, two, three, and four. We'll send a representative, and um, that conversation will be moderated by one of our graduates, um, and uh, Abby. And then, uh, then we'll hear from Christy, and then the panel three will be representatives from tables five, six, seven, and eight. Um, after the s that, that panel, there'll be an opportunity to hear from others who may feel that the conversation at their table was misrepresented or they, they have additional <laughs> thoughts. Um, and then, uh, you know, this sort of accumulates and then we get to hear Ralph talk or work with us this, this evening. And then tomorrow morning, if you still, you know, we, we, we want to make sure every voice is heard um, and that there's an opportunity for real dialogue. So I promise you that by the time you leave at noon on Saturday, if you have something to say to us, we will hear it. Um, uh, so that so when you go to the table, I hope you go in the spirit of um, creating as a verb. Uh, you know, it's not for most of us. It's not in our job title, but it's 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 an opportunity uh, to think and behave in a certain way. So I go to your tables in that with that in your minds and with a willingness to participate in whatever way you are able to based on wherever you are situated, okay? So there's a buffet out in the lobby or, and then uh, you are not assigned the, to any specific table, but I would not, um, I would not sit at a table with five of your best friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, mi let's mi let's, it's a mixer. Remember, this is college. This is like a mixer. Um, and then uh, we'll see where that takes us. Thanks.